Welcome, everybody, to the St. Maximus the Confessor Institute. I'm Michael Lofton. I'm going to be giving a lecture today on understanding outside the church there is no salvation. This is a dogma in the Catholic Church. It's a concept that says that outside the Catholic Church, one cannot be saved. This has been definitively taught by the teaching authority of the church, namely the magisterium. And it is not something that any Catholic in good standing could descend from. But how to understand it, uh, that's something else. It's a little bit more complicated than it may seem. When we say outside the church there is no salvation, it's true. But it needs to be understood properly and as the church itself understands it, not as any private individual would understand it. Now, as you can see, I have on my PowerPoint screen here the title of the presentation. I'm going to take a look at the next slide and just give some introductory remarks. The first one is, this is not an exhaustive survey of the different views on outside the church. There is no salvation in Catholic history. Um, if it were, we would be here a very, very, very long time. I'm going to try to deliver this lecture as quickly as possible. Um, so it's not going to be exhaustive. I hope that it's fairly comprehensive, that it addresses the major highlights, but you might find some points here and there that you feel should be addressed as well, and perhaps they should have been. So I hope you're gracious with the presentation. If I've left anything out that you might feel is important. The next point is not all views surveyed here in this lecture reflect the views of everyone else surveyed. That might sound like common sense, but you'd be surprised how many people would raise this as an objection. In other words, what I'm saying is that if I were to present, say, Augustine's view on baptism of desire or um, martyrdom uh, of blood, or namely what's called baptism of blood, um, if we were to talk about this in St. Augustine, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is Thomas Aquinas's view or that this is uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux's view. There could be some agreement there. I'm not saying that there isn't. I'm just saying that just because I address one particular person's view doesn't necessarily mean that everybody else that we're going to address holds to the same view. What I'm going to be doing is just picking out some highlights here and there and different concepts that we see in different historical figures that will help us understand what's taking place at the Second Vatican Council, especially in its document Lumen Gentium, paragraphs 14 through 16, which tends to be um, controversial for some who don't know the history of outside the church. There is no salvation. There might be things and concepts in Lumen Gentium that um, might be new to somebody who might not be very well versed with the history of this doctrine. So what I'm going to do is show different figures who held to different views and concepts and show how these concepts aren't new in the post-conciliar era and in the Second Vatican Council, that they are concepts that have been uh, addressed throughout history uh, by a multitude of figures. All right, and last point, again, to reiterate, outside the church there is no salvation. I abbreviated it there, E-E-N-S, extra ecclesium nola salus, which is um, Latin for outside the church there is no salvation. It is a dogma. So again, this has been definitively taught by the Catholic Church. There's no walking it back. You can't say, ah, I don't agree with that. Can't be a Catholic in good standing and dissent from something definitively taught, especially a dogma. So um, in fact, you would be a, a heretic if you were to do so. So we readily embrace it. We just properly need to understand it according to the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church, how it understands the doctrine. Because after all, it's the one who has, is definitively proclaiming this teaching. Well, we should go to that teaching authority to understand it properly. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide here. Let's talk about the necessity of baptism in Scripture because I want to start with some scriptural principles uh, because much of what we're going to discuss is really based on these principles. 
you know, different fathers, different theologians throughout history, different councils. They're trying to engage these principles that we see here uh, in Scripture. So that's that's effectively what is going on. Uh, John 3, 5, for example, Jesus says this, and he's, this is, of course, when he's speaking to Nicodemus. Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. This is very important because, again, this has been traditionally understood to refer to baptism. In fact, in the very next chapter, uh, the disciples are baptizing. Um, and you will see, um, well, I'm sorry, John the Baptist is baptizing, but um, you will see here there's a connection between, of course, the water of the sacrament and the Holy Spirit using the sacrament to regenerate or um bring that person into the kingdom of God, taking them from the domain of Satan and bringing them into the kingdom of God. So he's telling them, you can enter into the kingdom of God through this sacrament, through water and the spirit, namely baptism. This is important because he's saying no one else basically will enter the kingdom of God unless they come through baptism. Now we need to properly understand that, sure. And we're going to tease that out in a little bit. Um, but this kind of exclusivity is coming from Christ himself, where he's saying, look, you have to be baptized if you're going to enter into the kingdom of God, namely heaven. We can simplify it and speak, speak of it as heaven. Um, but that exclusivity isn't just something the Catholic Church made up. It's coming from Jesus himself here in this passage. And of course, elsewhere, John 14, 6, he talks about uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. So we see a unicity there um, of salvation that is only in Christ. We see that it is only through him that someone is saved. Of course, Acts mentions that as well. Peter in the book of Acts uh, mentions there's no, he mentions there's no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. So um, this exclusivity of salvation in Christ alone is coming straight from the New Testament. So these are principles that theologians and fathers and councils have to engage. These are the parameters that we, we have to stay within. All right, let's move on to the next slide here. <clears throat> There's another point that we need to consider, and that is the necessity of faith for salvation. Hebrews 11.6 says this, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So they must believe in God, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Two principles that must be believed in order to come to God. Uh, so, I mean, th this is effectively saying that faith is needed for salvation, which really shouldn't come as a surprise to most people watching this, I'd imagine. Now, yes, we do need to tease that out and, and understand it and make some nuances here, sure. But these are the general principles that we have to engage uh, before we can really address the nuances. We have to look at the, the big, broad principles. So moving on to the next slide here, let's talk about St. Justin Martyr. Of course, he's a second century church father, and he gives us a very interesting concept. It's uh, on the logos, which means word in Greek. Um, there's a debate on whether or not he's getting this concept from the Greeks or the Hebrews. I, I think that he's really getting it from both, but um, be that as it may, he has this concept of the seeds of the word or seeds of the logos that are in every person uh, prior to Christ. He wants to effectively say that uh, reason, especially that is in people who have not heard of Christ, it, that reason really comes from Jesus himself, who is ultimately reason itself. Uh, he is the Logos, as John 1 puts it. So uh, if there is reason in a person, it's seeds of Jesus, if you will, seeds of the word in them, which is, you know, hinting at the idea that God can work in a person and Christ can be at work in a person who's not uh, formerly a member of the church. So this concept is very, very ancient. And again, the quote goes on to say, We have taught that Christ is the first begotten of God, and we have declared him to be the Logos, of which all mankind partakes. Those, therefore, who lived according to reason were really Christians. So he, he sees people prior to Christ who are living according to reason, 
as Christians, even though they were thought to be atheists, such as uh, among the Greeks, Socrates, Heraclitus, and others like them, like Aristotle. He sees them as, as Christians before Christianity. Again, because he says that Jesus is ultimately reason, and if they are living according to reason, they're living according to Christ. Again, this is important because it's, it's implicit that Christ is, can be at work in somebody who is not uh, formally a Christian, formally in the church. Very, very important. Now, let's move on to the next slide here. This one is from St. Cyprian of Carthage, middle of the 3rd century. And he says this on Extra Ecclesium Nola Salus, which is, again, Latin for outside the church there is no salvation. He says, For they cannot live outside, since there is only one house of God, and there could be no salvation for anyone except in the church. So the famous phrase, no outside, you know, there is, there is no salvation outside the church, that you hear often repeated in Catholic history. The phrase is coming, especially from Cyprian. It's not new to Cyprian. Uh, you could argue that Ignatius uh, is, is implicitly talking about it. Uh, you could argue the same for Irenaeus that they're talking about this doctrine as well. They just don't necessarily use those exact words, but the idea is there in Ignatius and Irenaeus and others, and uh, as we see in Scripture itself. Um, <clears throat> but it is very, very noteworthy to um, consider that Cyprian is saying this very, very early on, like I said, middle of the 3rd century. So very early in Christian history, there's a very explicit attestation to this dogma that outside the church there is no salvation. If you're going to be saved, it has to be in the Catholic Church. There's really no walking that one back. All right. Next one is from, again, also St. Cyprian. On baptism of blood, a very important concept because when we talk about baptism, we speak about its necessity, as we saw there in John 3, 5. We need to understand that Yes, the ordinary way in which a person is baptized is, is, is through water, of course. But there are other ways to be baptized that are exceptional. They're not the rule. They are exceptional. Uh, but one of them is baptism of blood, being martyred for Christ. Um, if you are martyred for Christ, but you have not reached the baptismal font, according to many of the fathers, uh, as long as you're not in formal schism, that is, uh, you're not formally separated from the church. You are able to shed your blood for Christ, and you're effectively washed in your own blood. Uh, you're, you're baptized in your blood, and um, that will serve as baptism. So the graces of baptism are given to you through um, your martyrdom, effectively. There's also a concept of baptism of desire, which we're going to see later on. Uh, so keep that in mind as well. Now, again, here's the quote from St. Cyprian of Carthage. Let men of this kind who are aiders and favors of heretics know, therefore, first, that those catechumens hold the sound faith and truth of the church and advance from the divine camp to do battle with the devil with the full and sincere acknowledgement of God the Father and of Christ and of the Holy Ghost, then that they certainly are not deprived of the sacrament of baptism, who are baptized with the most glorious and greatest baptism of blood. So here you have Cyprian, who's very, very strict. If, on, on the idea that outside the church there is no baptism. Uh, <laughs> here you have him attesting to baptism of blood. And by the way, just so you know, he, he lost in that controversy uh, when he promoted the idea that outside the church there is no baptism, no valid baptism. He lost that debate with Pope St. Stephen, and Pope St. Stephen's uh, his view carried out. It carried the day and is what we uh, believe today. But again, here you have somebody who's very, very strict when it comes to the sacrament of baptism and its adherence, and even he's attesting to baptism of blood. So he's saying that there are other ways to be baptized other than water in cases of necessity, right? You know, if you have the opportunity to be baptized and you just decide to forego it, that's something else. Okay. So <clears throat> let's also talk about invincible ignorance. This is going to be a concept that we are going to see throughout church history, but uh, we can see it, first of all, in Scripture, in Jesus himself. 
and things that he said to the Pharisees. If I had not come, they wouldn't be guilty. Uh, they wouldn't be responsible for what I've said. But now that I've come, they're responsible. Things like that. that that's, that's an implicit attestation to invincible ignorance. But here you have St. John Chrysostom. Uh, who testifies to this concept as well. He says this, When we do all that is in our power in matters where we lack knowledge, God will give us his hand. But if we do not do what we can, we do not enjoy God's help. But notice this concept. When we do all that is, is in our power in matters where we lack knowledge, God will give us his hand. This is implicitly referring to invincible ignorance. But it should be noted, Chrysostom believed most, if not all, were culpably ignorant after the incarnation. What that means is uh, Chrysostom believed that after the incarnation, after Jesus, um, the second person of the Trinity, took on human flesh and became man. He believes that you know people who are uh, alive after that, aren't really invincibly ignorant. They're, they're uh, culpable for their ignorance because um, God would basically send a messenger or somebody to them to preach the gospel to them if they're really doing everything that they can. So Chrysostom doesn't necessarily think that anybody, you know, after the incarnation is invincibly ignorant. He, he's wrong in my estimation and also in the church's estimation, but um, that, that was pretty much his disposition and a lot of the early church fathers that was their disposition as well. You can even see it, you know, going into the Middle Ages with Aquinas, where they're, they're assuming that basically everybody is culpably ignorant and that it's just really not possible because the message has gone out, the gospel has gone out to all corners of the world, um, that people could not really be ignorant still. And uh, that's going to be a presupposition that is going to be challenged later on, and rightly so. Although that general disposition of saying people generally uh, don't have invincible ignorance, I think is a good one. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, <clears throat> but I do want to bring that out because I, I, I want to show that these the ideas that, you know, baptism isn't always necessarily connected to water, the graces of baptism, or um, that ignorance could be inculpable. You, you, you wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be culpable for something that you don't know. Um, I want to point out that these ideas are there in the first millennium. They're there in the church fathers. They're struggling with it. They don't necessarily uh, understand it the way that we would today, the way the magisterium has teased it out today. There have been some developments and nuances. Uh, but those concepts are there, and that's what I'm really trying to bring out here. All right, the next one is from St. Augustine of Hippo on diminishment of culpability. He, he sees that there are some things that can make somebody less culpable than another, uh, especially for not knowing you know, Christ. Uh, here, here's what he says, But those who maintain their own opinion, however false and perverted, without obstinate ill will, that's the key, they're not being obstinate in the air, especially those who have not originated the air, so they're not the ones who you know started this false teaching, by bold presumposition, presumption, I'm sorry, but have received it from parents who have been led astray and have lapsed. Uh, for example, many Protestants today, right? I mean, uh, unless you're Martin Luther or John Calvin or somebody like that, you, you, in, in your life today, you, you, you probably didn't start the Protestant Reformation, right? Uh, you, you've probably been born into Protestantism if you're a Protestant. Uh, not that there aren't converts, but generally those who are Protestants are born into it. They're born into a schism. So this is who he's really talking about, although they didn't have Protestants at the time. They did still have schismatics, so the concepts still apply. He says... <clears throat> Those who seek the truth with careful industry and are ready to be corrected when they have found it are not to be rated among heretics. He, so he sees a diminishment in culpability here for heresy and schism. Schism is being separated from the church, being separated from uh, somebody who's rightly a bishop or being separated from the pope. And then heresy is uh, that you're denying something that has been taught, especially dogma something that is definitively taught that is in scripture or sacred tradition. Um, so if you're denying one of those things, you're a heretic, but he sees a diminishment in culpability and he says, you shouldn't necessarily label this person a heretic because they, they, they're not knowingly denying 
something. They're not knowingly in schism. They're more born into this. So we could talk about formal heretics, material heretics. We could talk about formal schismatics, material schismatics. And uh, we can see a diminishment of culpability there. So these concepts are here early on in even figures like St. Augustine. All right, let's take a look at the next uh, slide here. Another one from St. Augustine on baptism of desire. So before we spoke about baptism of water, you know, you have to be baptized with water in order to receive the Holy Spirit. Then we spoke about baptism of blood. You could shed your blood for the name of Christ. If you're not able to reach the baptismal font, uh, that will suffice for you to receive the baptismal graces. And then we can speak of baptism of desire. You desire to be baptized, but you didn't reach the baptismal font. Uh, here he says, but as in the thief, he's talking about the thief on the cross, to whom the material administration of the sacrament was necessarily wanting. So what he's talking about is, uh, you know, the thief on the cross wasn't actually baptized with water, right? But we do know that Jesus told him, this day you'll be with me in paradise. And, of course, those who were in paradise were brought to heaven uh, after the harrowing of hell. So the question needs to be asked, okay, well, how, how could he go to heaven but he hasn't been baptized? But Jesus had already said, unless you're baptized, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus had already said it before, the thief on the cross. So what do we do here? Well, here's what he says. Um, it was spiritually present through his piety. So when the sacrament itself is present, salvation is complete. If the thief possessed the unavoidably, uh, unavoidably wanting, I think I, I have a typo there, but he, he's effectively wanting the desire. His piety is there. He just doesn't have the opportunity to be baptized. Um, he receives the sacrament, or at least the grace of the sacrament, if, if you want to get technical. He receives the grace of the sacrament um, in an extraordinary way. And I should also mention that when I say the grace of the sacrament, it, it's effectively when somebody is um, receives the grace of the sacrament of baptism through baptism of desire, um, it's noteworthy that that is for the remission of their uh, eternal consequences of their sins only. It's not for temporal guilt. So they would still, um, if they have any temporal guilt, they would still need to expiate that in purgatory. So, um, however, if somebody were to receive the sacrament of baptism, you know, through water, the way it's normally administered, uh, that remits both eternal and temporal guilt. So, uh, if they were to die immediately in that moment, they wouldn't need any purgation. They would immediately enter into heaven or the beatific vision. So I do want to throw that out there. All right. Next one here. St. Prosper of Aquitaine. He was a disciple of um, of St. Augustine. Uh, he speaks about the possibility of salvation for unbaptized infants, which is very important because um, it, it, again, goes to show that there is a possibility that somebody who may not have been uh, material, well, physically baptized with the actual matter of water, that it's still possible that God could give them the graces of baptism in an extraordinary way. We could speak about a baptism of desire vicariously through their parents, which is something that Cayetan, a theologian in the Middle Ages, well known for confronting uh, Martin Luther and his heirs, uh, Cardinal Cayetan, uh, talks about this in his works, but we see that here very, very early on in St. Prosper. He says, For indeed, if the parents were to make good use of this grace, the children also would derive a saving help from it through them. Uh, so he's talking about, you know, the, the, the uh, parents here are able to bring about, they're able to derive saving help for their unbaptized infants. Very important concept. He says, thus it follows that infants share the lot of those persons who whose right or wrong dispositions decide their condition. So the infant of a baptized person could receive the grace of baptism through their baptized parent, through their believing parent, effectively is what he's saying. The election was not withheld even from the children who failed to receive baptism. So he's explicitly talking about infants who had not been baptized 
when it was present in their parents. So their parents have baptism. So that just because the infant doesn't have uh, the sacrament of baptism doesn't mean election is withheld from them. They could still be one of the elect. They could still be saved. But it reached some children who were baptized without reaching their parents. So again, in seed form, we're seeing here in St. Prosper the idea that maybe even an unbaptized infant could be given the graces of baptism in an extraordinary way. All right. Uh, let's take a look at St. Thomas Aquinas in the next uh, slide here. St. Thomas Aquinas on invincible ignorance, baptism of desire, and also implicit faith. So a couple of quotes going on here. He says, For this reason, such like ignorance, not being voluntary, since it is not in our power to be rid of it, it is not a sin. Wherefore, it is evident that no invincible ignorance is a sin. On the other hand, invincible ignorance is a sin, if it be about matters one is bound to know, but not if it be about things one is not bound to know. So here we have the idea of invincible ignorance being discussed by St. Thomas Aquinas. And he, he's just speaking objectively here that there is an, uh, a concept of invincible ignorance. You couldn't possibly or reasonably have known uh, about something. Well, if you're ignorant in that case about something that you couldn't reasonably have uh, found out the answer to, um, you're not culpable for that ignorance. You're invincibly ignorant. God's not going to hold you accountable for what you couldn't have known. But he will hold you accountable, vincible ignorance, for something that you could have known, that you could have easily uh, found out. Okay, so this concept is there in Aquinas. Now, he's, he's not necessarily saying that he thinks that everybody's invincibly ignorant. In fact, uh, he, he wouldn't take that view. But the idea, the concept of invincible ignorance is there in St. Thomas Aquinas. So it's not, you know, foreign to uh, the Catholic tradition. He does go on to say some other things, though. If some Gentiles were saved without receiving any revelation, they were not saved without faith in the mediator. So he's talking about people prior to the incarnation. That's key. Uh, he says, because even though they did not have explicit faith, they did have a faith that was implicit in their faith and divine providence. Y'all remember Hebrews that we just looked at? That's what he's referring to there. Believing that God is the liberator of mankind in ways that he himself chooses. So what's effectively going on is he's speaking about the difference between explicit faith and implicit faith. Very important concepts. Um, he's saying that people prior to the incarnation could have what's called implicit faith in Christ. Um, they don't have an explicit faith in Jesus because Jesus hasn't even come yet. But their faith in him is implied, and it's implied in their reliance on God in his providence. Very important. Now, after the incarnation, he believes that you have to have explicit faith uh, in order to be saved. Because he believes that the message of Christ has just gone out to everywhere. You couldn't possibly have uh, you know, known otherwise. That doesn't take into account the discovery of the new world, for example. Um, <clears throat> which, which is going to throw a kink in the thing here and, uh, you know, throw, throw everybody into a tailspin and they're going to have to start using some of these concepts and applying them to, uh, the natives. So, uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but the, the key that here to take away is the difference between implicit faith and explicit faith. Um, that concept there is as early as St. Thomas Aquinas, if not earlier, uh, very, very important. We'll make some applications for that later on. All right, another quote from St. Thomas is, A person receives the forgiveness of sins before baptism insofar as he has baptism of desire, explicitly or implicitly. So here he does speak about a desire for baptism, baptism of desire. Somebody who didn't necessarily reach the font of baptism, but they desire it. He does talk about the forgiveness of sins for them. Um, and it could be an explicit desire for baptism or even implicit. Very, very key, very important, very uh, noteworthy concept because we're going to see that later on in Pius uh, the Twelfth, I believe. Uh, actually, in the Holy Office, I'm sorry, the Holy Office of 1949, uh, which is drawing on the teachings of Pius the Twelfth. He's saying that somebody could have a baptism, uh, a desire for baptism, it could save them, 
And it doesn't necessarily even have to be explicit. It could be implicit. They may not even know that they need to be baptized. In Aquinas' view, what he believes is that you do have to explicitly have faith in the Trinity and the Incarnation. Uh, you could have an implicit desire for baptism and the graces of the sacrament are given to you. But he wants to say that you know, your faith in the Trinity and Incarnation has to be explicit after the Incarnation, and that faith could be implicit prior to the Incarnation. That was Aquinas' view. He believed that if a person was following their conscience, God would send a messenger to them. He would send an angel or you know, a missionary, somebody would be sent to them to preach the gospel to them so that they would believe it. Uh, that's his view. It's not necessarily a view that everybody uh, takes or that some people take after Aquinas, but it, it is an option. You are still permitted to believe that view in the Catholic Church today. All right, another quote from him. Consequently, just as some are baptized with the baptism of desire through their desire of baptism <clears throat> before being baptized in the bapti baptism of water, so likewise some eat the sacrament spiritually uh, or they receive it sacramentally. I think that that's another typo there. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> prepared this PowerPoint in a little bit of a hurry and also multitasking, so you, you know how it is. Um, what he's effectively talking about here, again, is that some people can receive um, baptism through desire prior to actually receiving uh, baptism of water. Again, important concept because it's not something that is just made up in the uh, post-conciliar era. It's uh, actually pretty old. All right. Last point uh, there from that uh, PowerPoint slide is Aquinas believed explicit faith in the Trinity incarnation is needed for salvation after the incarnation. So again, to reiterate what I had just said earlier, um, he, he does affirm these concepts, but he's not necessarily saying that they, they apply to everybody after the incarnation. He does talk about some of these concepts like baptism of desire. He does speak about implicit faith, but he doesn't necessarily believe that somebody um, who has baptism of desire would only need to have implicit faith in the Trinity and the incarnation. He believes they have to have an explicit faith. So, All right, moving on to the next point here. Uh, Unum Sanctum from Pope Boniface VIII. A lot of history going on behind this one, but, uh, you know, we, we got about 30 slides and we're only on 13, so I'm going to uh, just uh, go through this uh, fairly, fairly quickly here. You know, Pius VIII, very famous for saying this, Moreover, we declare, state, and define, so this is generally seen as something taught ex cathedra and definitively, that for every human creature it is a matter of necessity for salvation to be subject to the Roman pontiff. You have to be subject to the Pope if you want to be saved. Very important. And that's true. And we need to affirm this as dogmatic. Every Catholic today should be able to affirm this dogma. The question is, does this subjection to the Roman pontiff have to be explicit? Or could it be implicit? He nowhere addresses that. It nowhere you know, states that. And as we've seen in Aquinas, there is a distinction between implicit and explicit faith in God. So, of course, there would be an implicit and explicit uh, faith in um, maybe the teachings of the church. And uh, we could apply the same thing to subjection to the Roman pontiff. We could speak about formal membership in the church and also informal membership in the church, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But this nowhere says, for example, that you have to be a formal member in the church and have this, you know, explicit knowledge of the Pope and uh, explicitly uh, being subject to him. It, it could be implicit. It, it doesn't really say either way, right? Uh, so you could hold the, either view. Uh, but, you know, either way, we should be able to affirm this dogma. Moving on to the next one, the decree for the Jacobites at the Council of Florence. So this was in the 1400s. It was a reunion council between Catholics and the Orthodox. And it says this, The church firmly believes, professes, and preaches, which is a very, very uh, solemn language for an ecumenical council. Most would argue that that kind of language being used by Florence, since there are no um, 
uh, anathemas and canons in Florence, that when Florence uses that language and it's speaking on a matter of faith and morals, that it's definitive. So most would argue that this is definitively taught. I would argue that as well. The church firmly believes, professes, and preaches that no one outside the Catholic Church, neither pagans, nor Jews, nor heretics, nor schismatics, can become partakers of eternal life. It's very, very, very forceful language and, and very clear that outside the Catholic Church, there is no salvation, neither for pagans, Jews, heretics, schismatics, any of them. But you will notice it doesn't really go into details on how someone could be a member of the Catholic Church. You could be a member of the Catholic Church through desire, through implicit faith, through implicit membership, instead of a formal membership of the Catholic Church. That's possible. So everybody who might say that, you know, it's possible that you could have baptism of desire and implicit faith in uh, the Trinity and the Incarnation and informal membership in the church, and it's possible for that person to be saved. Um, somebody who says that could still affirm what the Council of Florence says because it really doesn't address how one is in the Catholic Church. It's just saying that somebody, uh, there, there's really no salvation for someone who is not in the Catholic Church. But again, the question of, well, how do you participate? How do you uh, get in the Catholic Church? It's different ways to do that. All right. Moving on to the next one here. Francisco de Vitoria, Order of Preachers, the Salamancan School. Very important figure because here he's now engaging the issue of the natives after the discovery of the new world. Let's put everyone in a tailspin because, I mean, they discovered there's all kinds of people out there after the incarnation who have never heard of Jesus. What do we do with that? Of course, that was true of many people prior uh, to the discovery of the new world in the new world. I'm sorry, the old world. But um, tabling that issue, it became so much more apparent with the discovery of the new world that, okay, we, we got we to gotta figure this one out. How do we still maintain outside the church there is no salvation, but uh, also recognize that, you know, uh, it, would be, it would be wrong for God to hold these natives culpable for something they could have never known because that is a principle that is biblical god and and traditional god's not going to hold you culpable for something you couldn't have possibly known so what do we do here with the natives well here's what he says it is not sufficiently clear to me that the christian faith has yet been so put forth uh, put f before the aborigines and announce to them that they are bound to believe it or commit fresh sin. What he's effectively saying here is that, you know, just because the announcement of Christ by some of our missionaries going out to these natives, just because they've told them about Jesus doesn't necessarily mean that their failure to believe in that message is culpable. <laughs> um, in other words, just because somebody says, hey, you, you have to become a Christian, you have to be baptized, you have to uh, believe in Jesus to be saved, doesn't necessarily mean that person who hears that is automatically culpable for what they just heard. And here's why he says that. Very important. I say this because they are not bound to believe unless the faith be put forward to them with persuasive demonstration. So what he's saying is, just because you tell somebody Jesus is the only way doesn't necessarily mean that they're now culpable for that knowledge. You have to demonstrate it. It has to be persuasive for them to be culpable for the preaching of the gospel. Now, I hear of no miracles or signs or religious patterns of life. Nay, on the contrary, I hear of many scandals and cruel crimes and acts of impiety. And that, that was going on with some of the uh, people who are evangelizing them. There was some, were some scandals and cruel crimes. Hence, it does not appear that the Christian religion has been preached to them with such sufficient propriety and piety that they are bound to acquiesce in it. 
even though many religious and other ecclesiastics seem both by their lives and example and their diligent preaching to have bestowed sufficient pains and industry in this business had, uh, had they not been hindered therein by men who are intent on other things, effectively saying that uh, the gospel hasn't necessarily been preached to them in such a persuasive way that they are culpable for what they've heard. So again, he's speaking here about an inculpability for people who have even heard the gospel message. Very important today, because there's a lot of people today who have they've heard the claims of the Catholic Church, but they haven't really heard them persuasively. They don't really have a whole lot of good reason to believe what the church is saying with scandals going on and things like that. So that that's effectively what he's getting at, is there could still be an inculpability there. For somebody who has heard the gospel message, but hasn't heard it with demonstration and piety. Moving on to the next one here. This is going to be a uh, slide from Albert Piggyus on the possibility of salvation for Muslims. So here, uh, the theologian, I believe he was a Danish theologian, He's applying this co the concepts that we've been looking at so far, some of them. He's applying them now to the case of Muslims. Here's what he says. One cannot doubt that in so great a multitude of those who follow the doctrine of Muhammad, there are some who know and revere God, and they keep the law of nature, that is, their conscience. What is to be thought of such people? Now, if the ignorance of the Christian faith did not prevent Cornelius even without baptism, from being pleasing to God in Christ, Cornelius was in the book of Acts, how much less will the more, uh, much more invincible ignorance of these people prevent them from being able to please God in Christ? So he's saying that it is possible that somebody who is, for example, a Muslim, could be invincibly ignorant of Christ and could be pleasing to Christ, pleasing to God. He's saying it's possible He's not saying it's necessarily the case for every Muslim out there, but he is just saying it is possible to apply this concept to them. Very important. We're not just applying these things to um, you know, native pagans who have never heard of Abraham or the God of the Bible. It's now being applied to uh, figures uh, such as the Muslims who have an incomplete and distorted understanding of the message uh, that God gave to Abraham. Moving on to the Council of Trent on baptism of desire. It says this, and this translation that is going from the old Adam to the new Adam, Jesus, since the promulgation of the gospel cannot be effected without the labor of regeneration, that's talking about the waters of uh, baptism, or the desire thereof. As it is written, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What Trent is saying here is that if you're going to be part of the kingdom of God, you have to be baptized. And it's appealing to the quote that we saw from Jesus earlier, John 3, 5. You got to be baptized. But it's saying you could have that baptism in extraordinary cases, exceptional cases, um, if you desire baptism. So either the labor of regeneration, the actual washing of the waters of regeneration, of baptism, or the desire of it, baptism of desire. I heard somebody once, you know, I showed this to them in Trent, and they said, yeah, it's talking about the desire of baptism, not, the, not baptism of desire. Those are not the same thing. Absurd, they're, they're the exact same thing. The desire of baptism is the same thing as the concept of baptism of desire. And I'm going to throw this one in there for good measure. I could throw in many more. But here's a quote from St. Alphonsus Liguori, who explicitly understands the Council of Trent in the way that I just explained to you, baptism of desire. He says, now it is de fide, that is of faith, it's dogmatic, it's definitive, that men are also saved by baptism of desire. <clears throat> by virtue of session six, chapter four, which is what I just read to y'all, where it is said that no one can be saved without the labor of regeneration or the desire of it. So he himself recognizes that what's going on here in Trent, 
is that it's saying you either have to receive baptism through water or through desire. So baptism of desire. Moving on to the next slide here. St. Robert Bellarmine <clears throat> speaks about church membership and also baptism of desire. Very important saint and uh, doctor of the church. Here's what he says. Such a one is in the church with his mind or by desire, which is sufficient for his salvation. So he's talking about um, there's different ways to be a member of the church. You could be a formal member in reality, you know, through actual formal membership. You've received the sacraments. You're under the jurisdiction of a Catholic bishop in communion with the Pope. That's formal membership. But he's also speaking about... Um, a membership in the church that could be by desire. It could be informal. And that could be uh, sufficient for salvation, according to Bellarmine. However, he is not in the church bodily. So he's not a formal member in the church. That is by external communion. And it is the latter which makes one in the strict sense a member of the church on earth. So if you're going to, strictly speaking, be a member of the Catholic church, you would be explicitly a formal member. You've received its sacraments. You're in communion with the bishop and communion with the pope. Uh, but it is possible you could be part of the church in an implicit way, informally, through desire. And that desire could be implicit according to some of the theologians we've seen. Not necessarily for Bellarmine, but I'm just saying according to some of the other individuals we've seen, that desire to be part of the church could be implicit and it could be sufficient for their salvation. So um, when we come across these passages that talk about being a member of the church, yes, that's all well and good, but the question is, how do you become a member of the church? Well, obviously you could become a formal member, but is it possible that you could become a member of the church and be part of the church and not be part outside of the church? Uh, is it possible that you could be part of the church in an informal way? It's possible, according to some of the theologians and uh, saints that we've seen. So when we come across those passages that say, outside the church there is no salvation, yeah, everybody can affirm that. Um, but the question is, okay, how can you be a member of that church? Could it be implicit? Could it be by desire? Could it be informal? <clears throat> we uh, go on to read here a quote from Bellarmine next. It is, uh, let's see. I answer, therefore, that when it is said outside the church no one is saved, it must be understood of those who belong to her neither in actual fact nor in desire, as theologians commonly speak on baptism, because the catechumens are in the church, though not in actual fact, yet at least in voto, in resolution, uh, therefore they can be saved. Um, he, he's saying that some catechumens can be part of the church by desire. By desire. So here you have Bellarmine affirming baptism of desire effectively and saying that they could be saved. Suarez, Francisco Suarez, S.J., so he's from the Society of Jesus. Very important figure. One of the things that he says on this subject is this. Now, we are saying the same things with regard to anyone who has, ha who has faith in God and sincere repentance for sin, but who is not baptized, whether he has arrived at explicit or only implicit faith in Christ. So he's talking here about explicit faith or implicit faith. And for somebody who has not been formally baptized or actually baptized with water, it's possible that they could have implicit faith and that that could be salvific. He says, for with implicit faith in Christ, he can have an implicit desire for baptism, which St. or St. Thomas teaches can suffice. So here you have Suarez talking about implicit faith, explicit faith, and baptism of desire. Again, these are not concepts that are just made up recently. They are traditional. They are there in the theologians and saints throughout the ages. Juan de Lugo, uh, SJ, speaks about the possibility of Jews, Muslims, and even non-Christians being saved. 
He says, there are some who, while they do not believe in all dogmas of the Catholic religion, do acknowledge the one true God. Such are the Turks and the Muslims, as well as the Jews. Others acknowledge the triune God and Christ, as most heretics do. Now, if these people are excused from sin of infidelity by reason of invincible ignorance, they can be saved. So he's speaking about invincible ignorance. He's applying it to Jews. He's applying it to Muslims. He's even applying it to um, non-Christians elsewhere. And so he believes it's possible they could be invincibly ignorant and that they could have the graces of baptism. They could be saved in an extraordinary way. So here you have a figure where he's using very, very strong language um, that testifies to the idea that somebody could be a Jew or a Muslim or even a non-Christian, formally speaking, and yet still informally part of the church and could be saved. Uh, he doesn't necessarily say that this is happening all the time. He's just speaking about the possibility. And then he says, it would follow that a Jew or other non-Christians can be saved, for he could have a supernatural faith in the one God and be invincibly ignorant about Christ. So again, he's applying this to uh, not only Jews, but also non-Christians. And then lastly, he goes on to say, the possibility of salvation for such a person is not ruled out by the nature of the case. Moreover, such a person should not be called a non-Christian. Because even though he has not been vi visibly joined to the church, still interiorly, he has the virtue of habitual and actual faith in common with the church. And in the sight of God, he will be reckoned with Christians. So he's talking about somebody who has not, they're a non-Christian, they haven't been visibly joined to the Catholic church, but they could have virtues, the theological virtues, they could have faith, and they could be united to the church, though not visibly, invisibly, informally, he speaks about this possibility. The Lugo was never condemned, by the way. I mean, this was something he was explicitly teaching, uh, as were others as well. He's, he's just very, very clear about it. And uh, not only is he not condemned, but this is perfectly uh, tolerated by the Holy See. <clears throat> In fact, I mean, a lot of these concepts go to be applied by the magisterium. Let's talk a little bit about that. Pope Clement the 11th on grace outside the church. He condemns the Jansenists who maintained the following proposition. No grace is granted outside the church. This is what the Jansenist heretics we're maintaining that there's no grace granted outside the church. And the Pope condemns that. He condemns that view and says that's wrong. There could be grace granted outside the Catholic Church, in other words, according to Clement XI. So, uh, very important, because it does go to show that outside of formal membership, graces could be applied and administered. You see that in Clement the Eleventh. Pius the Ninth goes to speak about salvation for non-Catholics, taking a lot of these concepts that we've seen before and applying them. He says, certainly we must hold it as of faith, so it's part of the faith, that no one can be saved outside of the apostolic Roman church. Outside the church there is no salvation. But nevertheless, we must likewise hold it as certain that those who labor in ignorance of the true religion, that's invincible ignorance, if that ignorance be invincible, will never be charged with any guilt on his account before the eyes of God. So he's talking about it's possible that somebody could be invincibly ignorant and they're not going to be culpable for that ignorance. Uh, he goes on to say, It is known to us and to you that those who labor in invincible ignorance concerning our most holy religion and who assiduously observing the natural law. So notice he's talking about somebody who they're invincibly ignorant but they're also observing the natural law. So they're following their conscience and its precepts, which God has in, inscribed in the hearts of all and being ready to obey God. So they, they may not have a formal, explicit obedience to God because they may not know what God is demanding of them, but they're ready to obey them. It's, it's informal. It's implicit. They're ready to do it. 
If they live an honest life, an upright life, they can, through the working of the divine light and grace, attain eternal life. And it's possible that they could be saved in this condition, is what Pius IX is saying. He also goes on to say the following. In the Syllabus of Errors, the 17th, uh, 17th proposition, he condemns the following. Good hope at least is to be entertained of the eternal salvation of all those who are not at all in the true church of Christ. Now, a lot can be said here, but notice what he's condemning. He's condemning the idea that we can have a good hope that somebody who's not in any way in the Catholic Church could be saved. Um, in fact, you couldn't have a good, you can't just not have a good hope. You can't have any hope at all that somebody who's in no way part of the church will ever be saved. Nobody ever will ever be saved who's in no way part of the Catholic church. You, you need to go ahead and accept that. But it, it's curious, who he, he says, not at all in the true church of Christ. In other words, somebody, not my view, by the way, but somebody out there could go and say, well, okay, uh, but maybe we could have a good hope that somebody who is not a formal member of the Catholic Church could be saved. Um, you know, that, pop, that view is somewhat popular these days. <clears throat> Again, I, I don't agree with it. I, I think that it's definitely problematic. Um, but you could see how somebody who had maintained that view could wiggle out of this con condemnation and just say, okay, well, look, I'm not saying that, you know, these people that we can believe uh, you know, we can entertain this idea. We can have a good hope for their salvation. We're not saying that they're in no way. They're not at all in the true church, but we're just saying that they're part of the church in a uh, informal and uh, implicit way. You know, they, somebody could wiggle out of it that way. Uh, <clears throat> again, I, I think it's problematic for other reasons. So, all right, Saint John Henry Newman. He says this: the doctrine. In its Catholic form, he's talking about outside the church there is no salvation, is the doctrine of invincible ignorance or that it is possible to belong to the soul of the church without belonging to the body. So he's here affirming the idea of invincible ignorance, and he's also saying if somebody could be part of the church, part of its soul, they could interiorly be part of the church without being part of its body, without being a formal member. So he's talking about implicit or, I'm sorry, informal membership of the church. They might not be formally in communion with the bishop who's in communion with the pope, but they uh, might have that desire. It might be implicit, it might be explicit. They have that desire to be part of the church. They're ready to obey God. They're following their conscience. Uh, they're following the natural law. They're, they're doing everything they can with the light that they have. He's saying it's possible that they could belong to the church in an informal way. They belong to its soul rather than its body, and that's sufficient for salvation, according to Newman. All right. Pope Pius XII speaks about explicit and implicit membership in the church. He says, among those who are really members of the church. So here he's talking about formal membership. Those only are to be numbered who have received baptism and professed the true faith and have neither deplorably separated themselves from the unity of the body nor have been separated from it by legitimate authority for their most uh, serious crimes. So he's talking about those people who are actual formal members of the church. If you want to explicitly and formally be a member of the Catholic Church, you have to be uh, baptized, profess true faith, uh, and not separated, not in schism from uh, its body, its legitimate authority, its bishops. That's formal membership. But then he goes on to speak about an informal membership. He says, we urge each and every one of them, talking about people who aren't formal members of the church, to be prompt to follow the interior movements of grace and to seek earnestly to rescue themselves from a state in which they cannot be sure of their own salvation. So he's not saying that they can't be saved, but he says they, they can't be sure of it. For even though by a certain unconscious desire, notice unconscious desire there, uh, it could be an implicit desire, in which they may be related, so they, they, they could be related to the mystical body of the Redeemer, namely the church, uh, they remain deprived of so many and so powerful gifts and helps from heaven, 
uh, which can be enjoyed only within the Catholic Church. So there's many graces that they're deprived of if they are uh, unconsciously desiring to be part of the church, if there's an implicit desire there, and there's an informal membership. Um, you know, it's possible they could be saved, but they can't be sure of their salvation, and they are being deprived of a lot of graces. That's what he is talking about, and that's just not some spin that I put on Pius XII. That's coming from the Holy Office. That's how the Holy Office, uh, which we understand now to be the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, but the Holy Office, uh, the Office of the uh, Roman Inquisition, in 1949 sends a letter to Archbishop Cushing, uh, concerning Father Feeney, who was disputing uh, some of these things that we see uh, in the popes and in theologians. And he was holding to a very, very strict view of outside the church there is no salvation, which is not the view of the church. Uh, it goes on to, let me give you just some highlights from the Holy Office, 1949, its letter. Uh, it says this, But this dogma that is outside the church, there is no salvation, is to be understood as the church itself understands it. So it's essential that we understand this dogma as the church understands it. It also then goes on to say, God in his infinite mercy willed that their effects, which are necessary to salvation, can in some circumstances be limited, or I'm sorry, be obtained when the helps are used only in desire or longing. So it's talking about baptism of desire. And of course, it quotes what we read earlier. We see this clearly stated in the Council of Trent. So it's clearly saying that the Council of Trent affirms a baptism of desire as a possibility for salvation, and uh, th this is something that is preserved in the Catholic tradition. It then says, to gain eternal salvation, it is not always required that a person be incorporated in reality as a member of the church. So in other words, it's not always necessary for salvation that they become a formal member in the church. It's possible they could have an informal membership and gain eternal salvation. But it is required that he belong to it, at least in desire and longing. And it's not always necessary that this desire be explicit, as it is with the catechumens. When a man is invincibly ignorant, God also accepts an implicit desire so-called because it is contained in the good dispositions of soul by which a man wants his will to be conformed to God's will. So it's basically saying somebody could be in the Catholic Church. So we're not talking about those outside the Catholic Church. Somebody could be in the Catholic Church in an informal way and through desire. And that desire doesn't always have to be explicit. It could be implicit. So there could be an implicit faith, an implicit desire, granting them informal membership. So you can't just go around quoting uh, things from the magisterium that say outside the church there is no salvation because, um, you know, somebody is just going to rightly point out, yeah, sure, that's true. Outside the church there is no salvation, but it's possible to be part of the church in an implicit way, in an informal way, through an implicit desire, through implicit faith. It's possible. doesn't mean it's happening all the time. It, but it is possible according to the Holy Office and according to some of the saints and fathers that we've seen uh, and so on. So it also says, It is necessary that the desire by which a man is related to the church be informed with perfect charity. So they have to have the actual virtue of charity that God gives to the person either through baptism itself or through its desire, through an extraordinary administration, if you will, of the graces of the sacrament of baptism. And an implicit desire cannot have its effect unless a man has supernatural faith. So their faith uh, has to be supernatural. It can't just be a general natural faith in God that saves them. Nature doesn't save anybody. It has to be grace. It has to be a supernatural faith. Again, that faith could be implicit or explicit. It doesn't really go into that a whole lot. It does talk about implicit desire, which if you understand the concept of implicit desire, that automatically opens up the door for implicit faith. But um, that faith must be supernatural if you're going to be saved, it, it, regardless of whether it's explicit or implicit. It has to be supernatural. It has to be the theological virtue of faith that God gives to you, either through the sacrament itself or uh, the desire of it. All right. 
We're now going to go through paragraphs 14 through 16 of Lumen Gentium from the Second Vatican Council because they are very, very important to understand. We're going to see a lot of the concepts that we have uh, saw in the Fathers and in theologians and in councils. We're going to see them applied here in the Second Vatican Council. So I'm going to show how Vatican II can be read in an orthodox way. It's not heretical. Uh, it's, it's not something that we just need to throw away. It is um, able to be understood in a perfectly orthodox way. All right, it says, The Sacred Council wishes to turn its attention firstly to the Catholic faithful. So it's talking about Catholics here. Basing itself upon sacred scripture and tradition, it teaches that the church now sojourning as an exile is necessary for salvation. Did you catch that? The uh, Second Vatican Council is saying, the church is necessary for salvation. It's affirming outside the church there is no salvation. A lot of people uh, might find that baffling, uh, but it is it is definitely taught here by Lumen Gentium. Christ's presence to us in his body, which is the church, is the one mediator in unique way of salvation. So anybody saying that somebody else is a mediator, somebody else is a, is a way to salvation, does not know what they're talking about. Even uh, Vatican II recognizes that uh, Christ is the only way to salvation. It goes on to say, in explicit terms, he himself affirmed the necessity of faith and baptism. So again, it's saying that faith is necessary, baptism is necessary. Vatican II affirms that. Vatican II does not reject that. You know, Sure, that faith could be implicit. That baptism could be a baptism of desire or baptism of blood. Yes, we understand that. But it does affirm uh, the necessity of faith and baptism. And thereby affirmed also the necessity of the church. For through baptism as a door, men enter the church. Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse or to remain in it, could not be saved. That's a very, very forceful statement. It was one that always remained in my mind when I um, left the Catholic Church for a few years and is the main reason why I returned to the Catholic Church is because of Vatican II and what it says here. You can't be saved if you refuse to enter the church or remain in it if you know the Catholic Church is made necessary by Christ. Can't be saved. Very uh, strong, strong statement there coming from Vatican II. It goes on to say, they are fully incorporated into the society of the church. So it's talking about explicit membership in the church. Possessing the spirit of Christ, accept her entire system and all the means of salvation given to her, and are united with her as part of her visible body structure. So it's talking about actual formal membership. And through her with Christ, who rules her through the supreme pontiff and bishops. So they have an actual visible communion with the bishops. The bonds which bind men to the church in a visible way are profession of faith, the sacraments, and ecclesiastical government and communion. I mean, they're very much coming out of Pius, Pius XII, as we saw in uh, Mystici uh, Corporis, I believe is, is what it was. Um, very much coming out of Pius XII. If you want to be a formal member, you have to be a more member through profession of faith, sacraments, ecclesiastical government. It goes on to say, He is not saved, however, who though part of the body of the church does not persevere in charity. So you might be a formal member of the church, but if you don't remain in, per in charity, you can't be saved. So it's talking about Catholics, formal members, but if you don't remain in charity, you can't be saved. That should be a warning to us. He remains indeed in the bosom of the church, but as it were, only in a bodily manner and not in his heart. So he's a dead member of the church. He's a member of the church, but he's a dead member. So he's part of the tree, but he's a dead branch on the tree. All the church's children should remember that their exalted status is to be attributed not to their own merits, but to the special grace of Christ. So it's because of Christ that they are given all these graces and that they're a member of the church. And if they're saved, it's because of him. If they fail moreover to respond to that grace and thought word indeed, not only shall they not be saved, they'll be judged even more severely. And that should just go without saying to whom much is given, much is expected. All right. So Catholics of all, uh, of, of, of anyone else out there will be judged the most severely because we have been given so much. 
Catechumens who moved by the Holy Spirit seek with explicit intention to be incorporated into the church and are by that very intention joined with her. With love and solitude, Mother Church already embraces them as her own. So it's just affirming the traditional doctrine here that catechumens are part of the church uh, through baptism of desire, effectively, is what it's saying. The church recognizes that in many ways she is linked with those who are being baptized. So now it's talking about we're, we're linked to them. Being baptized are honored with the name of Christian, though they do not profess the faith in its entirety or do not preserve unity of communion with the successor of Peter. So it's talking about the Orthodox or the Protestants. Um, we are linked to them. And how is that? Through baptism. Because if the Holy Spirit is given to them, if grace is given outside of formal membership of the church and baptism is given to them, uh, well, there is a very true sense in which we could say then that uh, we are linked to them because the Holy Spirit has been given to them. doesn't necessarily mean that they're making good use of the Holy Spirit, but there is a link there because they've been given a valid sacrament through their baptism. And uh, if they're Orthodox, maybe through some other sacraments as well. For there are many who are who honor sacred scripture, taking as its norm of belief a pattern of life and show a show and show a sincere zeal. They lovingly believe God in the Father uh, Almighty and in Christ, the Son of God and Savior. They are cons uh, consecrated by baptism, in which they are united with Christ. They also recognize and accept other sacraments within their own churches, especially the Orthodox, or ecclesiastical communities. And when it's talking about other churches here, it's not talking about um, churches in the way that you know we would talk about the one true church. That's the holy universal church it's talking about other churches other local churches a local church is a church that has a valid bishop that's a local church um the there is a true sense in which we could talk about the orthodox having local churches uh, because they have valid bishops those local churches are lacking a universality though because they don't have communion with the bishop of Rome, so they don't rise above that local level uh, but we could still speak about them having uh, churches. But this, again, I want to guard against the idea that somehow this means that there are sister churches in the sense that the Catholic Church and these other churches are of equal status. No. The fullness of the Catholic Church is in the Catholics, not in these other local churches. They lack the fullness because they lack universality. Or other ecclesiastical communities. That's a, that's a fancy term for Protestants. Many of them rejoice in the Episcopate, celebrate the Holy Eucharist, and cultivate devotion towards the Virgin Mother of God. They also share with us in prayer and other spiritual benefits. Likewise, we can say in some real way they are joined with us in the Holy Spirit. So there's a joining, there's a link. For them too, he gives his gifts and graces whereby he is operative among them with the sanctifying power. So it's possible that the Holy Spirit is sanctifying them. Now, the key here is if the Holy Spirit is sanctifying him, he's also urging them to enter into full communion and formal membership with the church. So if the Holy Spirit's really at work in a person, he's going to be urging them to come into formal membership. But it is possible in exceptional circumstances that they don't reach that end uh, and they could be saved. Now, some indeed he has strengthened to the extent of shedding their blood. Now, this is going to be disturbing to some because Florence talks about even somebody who sheds their blood for the name of Christ, if they're a schismatic, they can't be saved. Now, here it's saying that some of these people who are not part of the church, i.e. schismatics, um, could shed their blood for Christ. You know, how do we reconcile this? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Florence is talking about formal schismatics, people who are formally in schism, knowingly. They, they have chosen to enter into schism against the church. Uh, Vatican II is not talking about formal schismatics. It's talking about more people who are born into a schism, and they unknowingly are part of it. That's effectively who it's talking about. So that's how we reconcile it. In all of Christ's disciples, the Spirit arouses the desire to be peacefully united in the manner determined by Christ as one flock under one shepherd. He prompts them to pursue the, this end. So he's prompting them to have full communion. Mother Church never ceases to pray, hope, and a work that this may come about. She exhorts her children to purification and renewal so that the sign of Christ may shine more brightly over the face of the earth. All right. 
Last paragraph here. <clears throat> Most controversial one. Finally, those who have not received the gospel are related. So now we're talking about people who are related to us. Not linked, but related. In various ways to the people of God. In the first place, we must recall the people to whom the testament and the promises were given and from whom Christ was born according to the flesh. It's talking about the Jews, right? So the, the, the first covenant and the first testament was given. On account of their fathers, this people remains most dear to God, for God does not repent of his gifts. That's coming straight out of the book of Romans. I mean, that's just directly Pauline language. God does not repent of his gifts. He makes nor, does not repent of the gifts he makes, nor of the calls he issues. Again, straight out of Paul. But the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator. So it doesn't necessarily say that they're saved. It's just saying the plan of salvation includes them. It could be referring to the fact that, okay, the people that it's about to talk about next, the plan of salvation includes them insofar as um, God could bring them into the church through implicit uh, faith, through implicit membership, through baptism of desire. Maybe that's the case. Or the plan of salvation includes these people that we're about to talk about in the way that if they are following their conscience, a preacher will come to them, preach the gospel to them, and they will explicitly believe in Christ and the Trinity. Uh, I'm sorry, in God. He'll, they'll believe in the Trinity and in the Incarnation, and they will repent of their sins, and they'll receive the sacraments, and they'll enter into formal membership. One could read everything we're about to say in that way as well. So when it says that the plan of salvation includes those who acknowledge the Creator, and it talks about Muslims, it talks about non-Christians, it's not saying that they remain in that state. One could easily read this to say that, no, they won't remain a Muslim, they won't remain an atheist, they won't remain a uh, Buddhist, they will repent of their sins, believe the gospel, they'll receive the sacraments, the plan of salvation includes them too. You could read it in that way. Or you could read it in the way that again says, okay, it's possible that they could have an implicit desire. They could have implicit and formal membership uh, and, and so on. All those concepts that we spoke about earlier. You could read it in that way as well. What you can't do is read this in a way that says that you know somebody is saved outside of the church no nuance, no qualification. You can't read it in that way. You also can't read this in a way that would say that some false religion saves that person or some false God saves them or some other Messiah or some other figure saves them other than Christ. You can't read that into what is going to be said next. But the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator. In the first place amongst, uh, among these, uh, there are the Muslims who are professing to hold the faith of Abraham. doesn't necessarily say that they successfully hold to it. They, they surely don't hold the faith of Abraham successfully. They do profess to hold it. And there are some ways in which they hold some things in the faith of Abraham in the way that we would, that we would agree with them on. But there are some fundamental aspects to their faith of Abraham that... Um, that, that are wrong. <clears throat> Along with us, adore the one and merciful God. That's, that's the part that's concerning to a lot of people. It says the Muslims, along with us, adore the merciful God. But you'll note, it doesn't say that they m successfully adore him. It doesn't say that they salvifically adore him. It just says that they adore the one merciful God, which shouldn't come as a surprise because Pius X and his catechism effectively says the same thing. But it doesn't mean that they do so salvifically. That's, that's the key here. It's just saying that along with us, they adore the one merciful God. I could be adoring the one merciful God and doing so in sin and do so without supernatural faith. I could do that as a Catholic, in fact. Um, you know, I could completely uh, go into heresy and commit mortal sins and then still adore the one merciful God as a Catholic. That doesn't mean it's going to save me. It's definitely not salvific. Um, it doesn't go into that. You, you, you can't read into it and just say, well, this means that the Muslims now are saved because they're worshiping the one true God uh, properly. No, it, it doesn't say that. 
who on the last day will judge mankind, nor is God far distant. So he's not distant from those who in shadows and images seek the unknown God. That shouldn't be disturbing to you. That's coming straight out of the book of Acts. That's exactly what Paul is, says uh, to the people in the uh, Are Areopagus. For it is he who gives to all men life and breath in all things. Again, a quote straight out of Paul. As, and as Savior wills that all men be saved. Again, coming out of Paul. Those also can attain to salvation who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel or his church, yet sincerely seek God and moved by grace strive their deeds to do his will as what is known to them through the dictates of conscience. So again, what we saw in the Holy Office and what we saw in many, many other theologians is just simply being uh, professed here by the Second Vatican Council. Nor does divine providence deny the helps necessary for salvation to those who, without blame on their part, have not yet arrived at an explicit knowledge of God and with His grace strive to live a good life. It's talking about people who have not yet arrived at an explicit knowledge of God, perhaps agnostics. Now, it's saying that He doesn't deny helps necessary to salvation for them. That doesn't mean that He saves them in their uh, agnosticism. It means that he doesn't deny helps to them. He could very well dispel their doubts and they would have an explicit belief in Christ and in God through the helps that is offered to them, right? It doesn't say that God gives them salvation and allows them to remain uh, basically atheists. So it doesn't mean that atheists are saved as a lot of people think. No, it's just saying God doesn't deny them help. That should come as no surprise. Of course he doesn't deny them help. Of course he doesn't. He gives everybody help. He gives everyone grace. Whatever good or truth is found amongst them is looked upon the church as a preparation for the gospel. She knows this. It is given by him who enlightens all men so that they may finally have life. Now, I want you to notice the next part, though. Because the next part is the part that most people miss. Notice what it says next, though. But often men deceived by the evil one have become vain in their reasonings. It's talking about people deceived by Satan. They've become vain in their reasoning and exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That's coming straight out of Romans 1. That's a direct quote. Serving the creature rather than the creator. Exactly straight out of Romans 1. And it says often men. So it's saying generally what's taking place is people are deceived by Satan and they've embraced a lie. So they're not invincibly ignorant and they don't have an implicit desire and they're not informal members. They're not being saved because often they're deceived by Satan and they've embraced a lie and they're idolaters and they're serving the creature rather than the creator. That's what it does say. So anybody who takes away from Vatican II that, oh, it just teaches everybody could be saved. No, it's saying, in fact, most people don't meet the description of what we've discussed above. Yes, grace and helps are available to them, sure, but they're not making good of them. They're not receiving those grace and helps because often they're deceived by the evil one. And often they're exchanging the truth for a lie. And often they're serving the creature rather than the creator. So we could say that in exceptional cases, yes, the grace, the grace of salvation and implicit desire and invincible ignorance is it available for people out there and it could apply to these people. But you know what? In most cases, that probably doesn't apply is what Vatican II is saying. Or some there who are living and dying in this world without God are exposed to final despair. Judas, anybody? Wherefore, to promote the glory of God and procure, uh, procure the salvation of all these, and mindful of the command of the Lord, preach the gospel to every living creature, the church fosters missions with care and attention. So the point is we still evangelize because we know in the majority of cases people are deceived and they need to hear the gospel. They need to believe in the Trinity. They need to be baptized because most people are deceived by Satan and they're not going to embrace the truth. They're not following their conscience. They don't have an implicit desire. They don't have an implicit faith. They're not informal members. 
That's what it's effectively saying. So we need to go out and preach the gospel to them and urge them to repent and urge them to come into the church. Vatican II is very, very traditional here. So there's, in fact, nothing that we saw from Vatican II that can't be read in a completely orthodox way and in a way that is in, in accord with what we've seen from previous theologians and saints and fathers and councils that we've examined. So uh, there, there's nothing really novel here. Vatican II is just pretty much summarizing uh, a long history of fathers and saints and councils on this topic. But it's taken the position, which is my position, that is, yeah, there are these exceptional cases, but in most of the cases, that doesn't apply. In most cases, people are not invincibly ignorant. They're not uh, seeking God. They're, they're not informal members. Uh, they're generally deceived by the evil one, and they're generally under God's wrath. And so we need to go and command them to repent and urge them to come into the Catholic Church. We can't depend practically, for example, on invincible ignorance or any of these concepts. We can't depend on them and just say, ah, God's going to save them in their ignorance. No, we can't bank on that. That is something that only God can know. So uh, we definitely can't presume upon God's grace to that end. Uh, let's move on. We have a couple more slides here. I'm going to bring the presentation back up. Should be able to see it. Uh, let me skip here. Got to go to, I believe it's slide 27. Okay. Now, Carl Rahner on the anonymous Christian, just really briefly, a whole lot that could be said here, but uh, I, you know, I think that I would be amiss if I didn't bring it up. Carl Rahner believes that Christ is the only way to heaven. He denies a plurality of saviors, so he's going to affirm the unicity of Christ. He's going to say that there's only salvation in Christ. He's going to put a check next to every dogma out there. So you give a dogma, Rahner's going to affirm it. So Wanner's a little harder to engage because he affirms all the dogmas, but then he comes out with um, a position that I think is untenable. I'll explain it in just a moment. But he comes out with a position that's untenable, but you can't accuse him of heresy. You, you could say that that's wrong, but you can't say it's heretical because he's, again, going to affirm every dogma out there. He affirms that uh, Christ is the only way to heaven. There's no uh, plurality of saviors that, you know, there's no, um, you know, Buddha, for example, wouldn't save you, or one of the Hindu gods doesn't save you. It's only in Christ that you're saved, and it's only because of what he merited that we're saved. So he's going to affirm that, but then he does seem to indicate in his uh, Theological Investigations, Volume 5, he does seem to indicate that, uh, that and actually, I believe it was Volume 16, I apologize, not Volume 5, Volume uh, 16, he does seem to indicate, though, that people who are invincibly ignorant um, could receive grace, that is, you know, the grace that Christ merited for them. They could receive what Christ has done for them through other religions. Uh, in other words, if they're invincibly ignorant, their other religion that they're currently in, uh, God uses it to communicate the grace of Christ and the way that he would use the sacrament of baptism, for example, to save somebody, he would use their other religions to save them. And that's where I say you, you can't call that heretical because of the way in which he phrases it. It's still, <laughs> he's not denying a dogma, but what he's effectively saying here is still wrong. It, it's still something I, I could definitely not agree with and I think is very, very problematic, but you can't accuse it of heresy in the way that he phrases it. Um, but the idea that it's through other religions that God is administering his grace for the invincibly ignorant, I would say is utterly false, 100% false. Um, it is, of course, we, we all agree it is through Christ. Yes, these people could be invincibly ignorant, so God's not going to hold them in, you know, culpable for something they're ignorant of. But if they're saved, it's in spite of the false religion. It's not through it. It's by him giving them extraordinary graces in an extraordinary way and accepting an implicit faith and an implicit desire and an informal membership. It's not through somehow communicating graces 
through a false religion. Even though we understand that, yeah, there are some things in a false religion uh, that could be true. You know, not everything that somebody says who's in a false religion uh, is is wrong. There are some things that um, people can get right, but then there's a lot of grave error mixed in there as well. Uh, this is where I would very, very strongly disagree with Ron, or, and, and I question whether I'd even put this in this lecture. Uh, but I, again, I did feel I would be amiss if I did not at least bring it up. So I wanted to throw out Rahner's view there. Uh, Pope Benedict the uh, does say some very, very curious things here. Uh, in Spes Salvi, paragraph 46, he's, he's talking about those who are just extraordinary saints here on the world, receptive to God. And then he talks about those who will never accept God and are completely against him and people who, you know, will be lost in hell forever. He talks about those two groups of people. And then he goes and talks about of a third group of people. And he seems to think that the majority of people meet this description. He says, yet we know from experience that neither case is normal in human life. For the great majority of people, we suppose, there remains in the depths of their being and an ultimate interior openness to truth, to love, to God. So what he's basically saying is most people don't fit into those two categories. Either they're, they're an extraordinary, heroic, virtuous saint, or they're completely opposed to God, evil, satanic, and would never embrace him. He's saying most people don't fit in those two categories. Most people fit somewhere in the middle where they're open to God. And then he goes on to say for such people, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 3 could apply to them, which is the traditional text for purgatory. So it, it seems that in, in Benedict's mind that he thinks the majority of people um, could be in that state where, they're open to God, where they're, they have implicit faith, they have implicit desire for baptism, they're an informal member, and they, they're going to need a lot of purgation in the afterlife, but they're still open to God. And I get it, I, I understand the, the temptation to go there, but I think there's still a lot of problems with it. And, and I'll note that even though this is... Um, you know, the, this actual document is part of the magisterium, he goes on to say... When, when he's talking about this in context, he's talking about supposing, he supposes that this is the case. So he's not necessarily saying that you're bound to believe this. This is now a magisterial proposition that you have to affirm. He's saying we, we, we may suppose that this is the case. He's effectively just giving his opinion there. So I don't necessarily think that this is binding on any consciences uh, of the faithful, but I do wanted to throw it out there because I think it is interesting that Benedict took that position. Um, in conclusion, let me give just a couple concluding remarks. Again, outside the church, there is no salvation. It's a dogma. You have to affirm it, like it or, like it or not. And personally, I do like it. Just saying. Uh, but, but whether you like it or not, if you're a Catholic, you have to affirm it. Also, it must be understood as the teaching authority of the church understands it. So we can't just say, I'm going to understand this in the way that I want to understand it. You have to understand it in the way that the Catholic church has taught it. So you have to understand it in the way that uh, Florence teaches, Una Sanctum teaches, that Council of Trent teaches, and that Vatican II teaches. You have to understand it in light of the entire uh, magisterium. Uh, we're not free to just pick and choose whatever we would like. One can be in the church with certain conditions while still lacking formal membership. So again, there could be an implicit desire. Uh, I'm sorry, an implicit membership, I should say, in the church. Uh, there could be an implicit desire for baptism. There could be an implicit faith in the Trinity and the Incarnation, which are necessary for salvation. Um it, th those things could be true. It's, it's possible. There could be an invincible ignorance. Somebody could be following their conscience. They could be an in informal member through implicit desire and implicit faith. All that could be true. But I still want to say the disposition of Christian history is to assume culpability and leave in culpability to God. In other words, I still want to say that those things could be true, but they are exceptional the disposition needs to be that we assume somebody is culpably ignorant, that they're not a member in any way of the church, 
formally or informally, explicitly, implicitly, that they don't have an implicit faith, that they're not invincibly ignorant, that they're not following their conscience. I mean, after all, how, how many people actually follow their conscience? I mean, very, very few, I would imagine. Um, we, we need to assume instead that there is a culpability there. We need to assume, as Vatican II put it, that they are deceived by the evil one and they've exchanged the truth for a lie, as Romans 1 puts it. We need to assume that and not assume that they're invincibly ignorant and that they're inculpable. We leave that to God. We recognize it's a possibility. We understand that's possible. But we leave it to God to determine that. We will assume they are culpable and go out and preach the gospel to them and call them to repentance and call them to faith and call them to membership, call them to the sacraments. That's what we need to do. Because the majority of Christian history has been to assume that culpability. <clears throat> I think the problem really with the post-conciliar era is not the teachings of the Catholic Church. It's not Vatican II. It's not what Vatican II said. From what we saw, Vatican II is orthodox. It's not what any of the pre-conciliar popes said. It's not what any of the post-conciliar popes have said necessarily. I think that the problem, especially here, is the idea that we are assuming inculpability. We're assuming invincible ignorance of people. We're assuming an implicit faith and an informal membership in the majority of people. We're assuming it. And we're just saying, you know what? It's okay. We don't have to evangelize them. We don't have to warn them to come to Christ. We can just bank on these exceptional cases and make them the rule. That's the problem. I think the application of the teachings out there are problematic, and it also flies in the face of what the Second Vatican Council teaches at the end of paragraph 16, which Ralph Martin wrote a whole book on uh, going into that. So I have him to thank for that, for pointing it out. So again, in conclusion, I think the problem that we have today is an assuming of the exception and making the exception the rule. And what we need to do as a, a solution here is not throw out the teachings of the church or become reactionary uh, theologians uh, and Catholics and um, maybe even throw out what the Second Vatican Council says all altogether or become set of a contest or something like that. I think what instead we need to do is just moderate our understanding here by saying, Yes, all these things are true, but they are exceptional. And what we need to do is not assume exceptions and not presume upon God's grace, but what we need to do is warn people we need to assume culpability and uh, act accordingly based on that. And if in the end that person is invincibly ignorant and has implicit faith, we leave that to God to determine. But we can't read a person's heart, and we don't know what God intends to do with a person so we're going to assume that they're culpable and we're going to preach the gospel to them and call them to the church and so on and so forth. Well, anyways, I hope this was helpful. Please let me know if you have any questions. Post them in the comments. I'll do my best to get to them as soon as possible. Again, this was not an exhaustive uh, you know, lecture here. There, there's a whole lot more that could be said, but I wanted to try to get it into one lecture so I had to you know, cut a few corners here and there. So again, I apologize if I didn't get to some of the things that you might feel are, are pressing uh, when it comes to this topic. But once again, I hope you enjoyed this and found it helpful. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe as well. And also check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you would like to support us. God bless.